So hello and welcome, my name's Steve Nobel and today I'm speaking with Philip Cargom on the Druid Animal Oracle. Now Philip always wanted to be a writer and really forgot about it until he met a publisher at a dinner party in London. This was when he, when he was in his late 30s and he was invited to write a book on Druidry which went on to be a bestseller. Now Philip is a psychologist, psychotherapist and writer on Druidry. He's the author of many books and, in, and oracle decks including the Druid Animal Oracle and the Druid Plant Oracle, both of which he co-authored with his wife Stephanie. And he writes on his website, although my spiritual practice is rooted in Druidry, I believe we have entered an era in which we can move beyond attachments to labels, drawing instead upon the perennial wisdom, being inspired by the wisdom of all spiritual paths and teaching, following the way of the universal mystic. And you can follow Philip on his website at philipcargom.com, and I'll put a link with this uh, podcast. Uh, Philip, welcome to you. Hello there. Hi. Can I just ask you about how did you get involved in Druidry in the first place? Well, I was, it was when I was very young, when I was 11. It was as if I sort of woke up when I was 11. And um, my dad, although he wasn't uh, uh, interested in spirituality himself, he, he was rather strangely surrounded by people who were. Mm. And uh, he, he had a friend who he worked for who was the old chief druid and um ross nichols oh. and whose, whose druid name was new in the ash tree and um he ran a college in london my dad worked for him as a as a tutor and because they were friends he was often round at our house so he was a sort of uncle figure um uh, who would come round and so i met him at an early age and uh in that same year i read a biography of the buddha the life of the buddha mm. and and i decided at that point that that was the most important task the the path the spiritual path the path to enlightenment was the most important sort of uh t task or game one could play or task one could accomplish mm. and um and then when when i was 15 or yeah, yes, about 15, I was invited by Ross Nichols, the old chief druid, to photograph the ceremonies and to participate in the ceremonies too. Mm. And uh, I became intrigued and fascinated and uh, asked to join the order. And um, I went through a period of a apprenticeship through sort of 16 and 17. He wouldn't let me join until I was 18. Um, the sort of key members of the order cast my horoscope to decide whether I was worthy and so on and uh, and then I was initiated on Glastonbury tour when I was 18 wow. so that's how it started yeah amazing was it was there a kind of uh, um, much connection did you find between Buddhism and Druidry were there links well um, it's only actually much later funnily enough he gave me a huge book but it seemed like about 800 pages um, on the connections between the proto-Indo-European civilizations, uh, which he, he, he felt that I should read in connection with Druidry. He was particularly interested in Jainism, mm. which is a, a religion that uh, is pre-Vedic, so they say, and uh, the main pro pro proponent of Jainism was uh, contemporary with the Buddha and, and, and was so similar in many ways that people, scholars at some point thought that actually it was the same person that, that this has been uh, there had been a confusion mm. but actually it was a different person and um and i i didn't i must confess i didn't read the book when i was a teenager it was too heavy going and it's only in the last 10 years that i have come to realize the the connections that exist and we've started a project called the one tree project where we're working with friends in the dharmic traditions in buddhism jainism and Hinduism to explore the common Indo-European origins of uh, of our traditions because you have these extraordinary similarities between um, Sanskrit and Old Irish for instance mm. and um, so there, there is a connection but I wasn't aware of it at the time and that's one of the uh, one of the advantages of getting older the few yeah. advantages there yeah. are <laughs> is that you 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 know seeds that were planted i think you know we're in in a world where we want things quickly and the internet has speeded everything up so much mm. that, that 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 i think one of the things that i've learned is that people can say things to you or you can read an idea in a book or, or, or a spiritual teaching that can actually only sort of bear fruit years, decades later. And that was one of the gifts he gave me you know, I've, when I followed him as a, as a young man, is I wasn't aware of, of how much he was giving me. 
And there were various things that sort of incubated for many, many decades and then came to fruition. And, and that's, that's been one of them. Wonderful. Now, I, I, I've, I've kind of been interested in Druidry myself, and I know uh, the tradition was never, not very much liked by the Romans when they were here in Britain, and actually they seemed to do their best to wipe it out. And I also know Caesar wrote extensively on the Druids, but not always from a very uh, positive uh, point of view. Much has been lost. Uh, Druidry was an or oral tradition and nothing written down. How easy or challenging has it been to really reconnect with, uh, with that path? Well, sure. It's 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 um, the, the, there's a downside and an upside, uh, a, a sort of. Uh, but there is there is a gift inside there. Um, I think one of the things that people think is well, since classical druidry or ancient druidry died out by about the sixth or seventh century mm. uh, because of the incoming Christianity, and Christianity had a monopolist agenda prior to that. Uh, although the Romans did clamp down on Druidry, you know, most famously in the case of Boudicca or Bodicea, um, uh, they, they, they in fact did actually tolerate local cults. That was one of their rather cunning ways in which they were able to govern such a vast empire mm. was not actually uh, trying to repress all the local religions and cults and so on. Um, but Christianity had a different agenda. And um, so by the 7th century, uh, Druidry had died out in, uh, in these islands. Mm. But uh, the traditions continued in all sorts of ways and then became uh, people became interested in it again a thousand years later mm. in the sort of 16th and 17th centuries. So there was this period of the Druid revival. So... Um, uh, so you have you have 300 years of recorded history of Druidry, modern Druidry, if you like, from the sort of 16th, 17th century onwards, which in itself is a substantial body of material. Mm. Um, but uh, the fact is, it's undoubtedly true that we've lost we, we've lost a lot of material. And unlike indigenous traditions, which have a continuous thread, we don't have that. Mm. But I think there's a there's a blessing in that in as much as there's a sort of freshness in modern druidry which comes from the fact that we don't have centuries and centuries of of dogma attached to it mm. commentary upon commentary edict upon edict which the more established religions and the older traditions do have mm -hmm. um so so i think there's a gift in that and i think you can also turn the whole thing on its head and say well look where do spiritual traditions come from where do you believe they come from and i believe they come from outside the world of time mm. they and space they they come from another dimension they sort of tumble into our world at a, at a particular historical point and at a particular geographical location and then they do their work and so actually druidry once you connect with it um, you're actually connecting with the source beyond time and space, and so that we can be druids today. We've got 300 years of, of, of recent past and of written material to draw on. Then we've got these ancient traces of these ancient traditions that you get from way back, the ancient druids. And you've got a kind of direct connection beyond space and time. Mm, wonderful. Now, here we are talking about the Druid Animal Oracle. Um, Judeo-Christian Judeo cultures really taught us to be afraid of animals. You know, there's a, there's a kind of goat association with the devil and all that. In subduing the earth, are we not subduing our own primal nature? Well, I think that's exactly it. I mean, what you say goes to the heart of the problem that uh, the Abrahamic religions and to some extent some of the teachings in dharmic traditions as well rejection of the body and of mm. the flesh and so on uh which have caused huge problems really this kind of dualism where you split your view of the world into good and bad uh bad includes the dark uh then the feminine uh the earth Mm. Uh, good it equals heaven, the sky, light, and so on. Uh, hugely problematic. And I think the reason why Druidry and other nature religions and spiritual ways are becoming so popular in the last, or have become so popular in the last sort of 20, 30 years, is because we've seen the consequences of that dualism in the degradation of the earth, the degradation of women, and so on. And, um, and we need, desperately need, philosophies and spiritualities that have a holistic view. Um, 
that don't split us into body and spirit, but see us as whole beings, uh, including our animal natures, our body natures as well. Um, and so, and 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 once you take that approach, you start to see that there's a tremendous um, law and tremendous spiritual gifts within within the animal realm. Now, the wisdom of the animal world is drawn from this ancient Celtic tradition. Can you say something about the kind of Celt's reverence for the animal kingdom? Mm. Well, we have, you know, we have all sorts of interesting findings about um, animal animal remains that were buried with human remains, uh, animal sacrifices or, or, or apparent sacrifices where bones from animals seem to be seem to have been put in special places and so on and but primarily we have the evidence from the the stories from celtic tradition mm. where animals give us teachings convey um convey life lessons to us and and really that's that's how um that's that's how stephanie and i uh, that was our way into to this druid animal oracle and working with the sacred animals was um, looking at the number of stories about animals in Celtic folk tales and traditions, mm. and um, looking at those stories from a, a 21st century um, perspective and a psychological perspective as well, sort of informed, if one could say, spiritual psychological perspective, and um, saying, what, what, what are these actually saying to us today, and what do they mean for us? Mm. And, um, and, what, and at the time we, we worked on the Animal Oracle, it was a time when the, the Folklore Society had this fantastic library in London. It was, I, I stumbled upon it by chance when I was doing my degree in psychology at UCL. And when I had to do essays, um, the psychology library was always full of people. Mm. And I found this large room around the corner from the psychology library uh, in Senate House in, in London, um, which was empty. And I wandered in and I discovered it was the Folklore Society Library and nobody ever went in there. Uh -huh. And, and of course, this was bad news for my psychology essays because I was so distracted by the, the volumes on the shelves. But I found this treasure trove of information. And um, when I, I'd, I'd left the university, and years later, when I was working on the Animal Oracle, I would go up to UCL and you were allowed to borrow 10 books at a time in those days. Mm. So I would go and take 10 books, old books about uh, Celtic uh, folklore and tales uh, on the animals. And I would take them home on the train down to Lewis in Sussex where we lived and extract um, the material. Mm. And um, so that's how, that's where we go, had our source material for working with the Druid Animal Oracle. Now, I know that um, these ancient tribes and clans um, had their totem animals and families had totem animals. There's a great reverence for animal kingdom. But the ancient peoples were not vegetarian. They hunted and ate the animals they thought were sacred. It seems a paradox, really, to me. Well, it does. Um, we don't know whether some of them might might have been vegetarian. There, there might have been, you know, the... the Sh shamans all in traditional societies have always been peculiar mm. and um, uh, haven't acted like everybody else so who's to say that uh, that wasn't the case mm. and um, but of course their relationship to the natural world was was very different I think from ours and as much as they would one can believe that they were completely embedded in it and and that there was a reverence for and a respect for the animal world that is very different from the way we go about with factory farming yeah. um, a mass sort of consumer production of meat products yeah. that we have today now um, so working with animal powers is a central feature of shamanism you mentioned shamanism and uh, they were animals were seen in in that tradition as teachers and guides which is a very different way that maybe modern people um, look at animals uh, animals revered for their ability to bridge these different worlds of material and spiritual can you say something about this th this this ability of animals as guides and teachers and helping us to bridge these different worlds let me let me give an example perhaps um, I imagine imagine someone who is going through a difficult patch mm. you know 
being a human being in the world today is hard and we can feel so vulnerable and and subject to so many stresses and traumatic events and so on and so feeling weak and vulnerable and a victim uh is a, is you know s sadly something that you know all of us ha have felt and can feel at any given time and but going in in meditation or on a shamanic journey or going inside and making contact when you make contact with an animal guide or a teacher yeah there's something it's hard to describe in in words but something happens it's like a meeting where there um what is conveyed to you may it may come across telepathically as as an understanding as an insight which you could say is um at the mental level mm. so so they they give you an under but often what will happen with an animal guide is the what will be transmitted to you will be a power an energy a quality a feeling that gives you strength may give you healing and give you courage and the ability to face the day or to face the trauma or to face the difficulty that you're dealing with mm -hmm. so hugely valuable hugely healing and um and 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 and, th and this is what is meant when we talk about uh, animals being able to be guides and healers and teachers so and, so, and to be more specific to give you say say to give us to, to nuance that as they say um imagine you're going through a, a tricky patch with a partner you know mm -hmm. you're having a, a, a breakup or, or a huge misunderstanding with somebody um there are two ways to go often in those things sometimes it's appropriate to um show your strength to stand firm to very clearly confront challenge and challenge the person but at other times, the most appropriate strategy is to actually, you know, do what uh, you're supposed to do in judo, which is to, you know, step swiftly aside and let the other person's own weight carry them lumbering out of the way. Mm. Um, and um, depending on, you can imagine making, con say, the, the fox is a wonderful symbol of the in the Druid Animal Oracle. We've got a, an image of the fox walking on ice. And... Uh, there's a way in which the fox is associated with diplomacy, with with the ability to you know tread tread on ice. In other words, tread very delicately and careful, and to get out of the way when necessary. And making a connection with a fox as a guide might well uh, help you just to just to you know lie low. This isn't the time to confront this person. Just just lie low. Or say meeting the bear might might be might be telling you no you know stand tall and firm and growl a little bit mm, wonderful <laughs> so i guess <clears throat> as you was kind of prom writing this deck uh, with your wife and also promoting it over the years i guess you've de developed very strong relationships with some of these animals you talk about and i guess they're very present with you in your you know uh, challenges projects could you say something about their input into your kind of life well, well, yes. I mean, I think that's you know that's why I follow Druidry, and and that's why I love it, is because um, every aspect of the natural world, animals, plants, you know, stones, the stars, the the idea in Druidry is that there, there is teaching there. They, they are allies and friends and partners in this extraordinary sort of adventure of life that that we're going through, and. Um, and 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 so um, and so in a way that's that's that affect that affects everything in life. You know, um, it's hard to separate out individual instances. Um, I remember one. I mean, let me give you an example of of, of one case where I was in uh, the waiting room. I've very rarely been in court, mm. but I was in a in a courthouse. Um, uh, awaiting a, a hearing about some anyway the, the, uh, the trivial matter which had gone to court and what I hadn't expected is that in these courts um, you sit in the waiting room with the people that you are up against which is the most extraordinarily challenging situation to be sitting in a waiting room like a dentist's waiting room <laughs> with with the other side hmm. i mean i um i don't know whether that happens in all courts but certainly uh here it did and i remember closing my eyes and you know the whole process was delayed so i had to sort of sit for an hour 
uh, with this person opposite me. And I went inside and, and asked for help. And immediately the most beautiful stag appeared in my awareness mm. and just stood there. And, and one of the things that happens when you encounter animals in the inner world is, th is that you're often invited to become them. Mm. It's this, this merging process, which is very beautiful if you can allow it. And there's a tremendous dignity in a stag. Mm. And um, one of the things that it conveys is, is, is dignity and independence and pride, pride in the, in the best sense of the word. Mm. Um, and so I was able just to become this stag and just to be there, um, not being aggressive, not attacking, but just standing tall and standing firm. Um, and so that's just, you know, one example of, of the way in which one can, can um, you know, work with, 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 with animals to be of value in, in one's everyday life. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, um, some of the animals you speak of in the deck are certainly no longer part of the British landscape. You know, for example, bears, uh, boars, wolves, for instance. But can mm. they still speak to us from the spirit worlds? Well, yes, and, and boars still are, by the way. Oh, um, really? oh. Some, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, somebody uh, made the mistake or the or had or, or the sensible move of introducing wild boars into um, you know some um, territory in the south of England, and they escaped, and they're all over the place now. Oh. Um, so wild boars are around. Um, bears, of course, are around on mainland Europe. Yeah. Uh, wolves too and there are moves to try and get wolves back into uh, into Britain um, but but th 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 of course what you raise is a very interesting question of what happens to the extinct species mm. um, one of the tragedies of the time we're living in is we're going through this mass species extinction mm. uh, which is extremely serious and um, I like to believe, and my ex my inner experience is is that these these beings and these creatures, these magnificent creatures, do exist. Uh, that what we experience on the physical world isn't the only show in town. Mm. You know, uh, scientists tell us that everything we see, everything we touch, is only four percent, uh, because the known universe and the, the ma what we talk about as matter is only 4% of what's out there, which is extraordinary. So dark matter and dark energy, which, which, is just, uh, which are terms for what we don't understand and what we, we know it exists, but we don't, so we, they've given it this label, dark matter and dark energy. Um, it, it compromises 96% of reality. Mm. And that, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary statement. I had a wonderful long evening with a professor from UCL who's a friend of mine. Um, the other day and we were uh, for fun we were trying to convert each other to our points of view I was trying to convert him to the spiritual worldview he was trying to convert me to the reductionist scientific worldview and uh, we didn't succeed so in the end we agreed to disagree but his parting shot to me was well you know you've got one argument in your favor which I can't deny and I said, what's that? And he said, it's, well, the fact is, everything I'm talking about relates to the 4% of, of reality. And there's 96% that we haven't got a clue about. <laughs> um, mm. so, so, you know, w what we're living through and what we're experiencing from our own personal difficulties and triumphs through to the difficulties that we see in the world today, I think it's really important to Take it seriously, not be in denial about it or to be all woo-woo and say, you know, we're not interested in it. It's important to take it seriously, but it's also important to say, this isn't the only show in town. And mm. um, so that's what I hope for, is I hope that at some other level of reality, all these species still exist and can manifest again or, or are manifesting again, perhaps in different worlds and different realities. Mm. Because I think possible there are multiple universes as well as very you know um, cosmologists take the idea of multiple universes very seriously there's all sorts of theories like um, uh, um, m theory and so on which seriously discusses the possibility that there are multiple realities and universes so how does someone use the deck what would they use it for well there's a couple of ways you can use it i mean one one is to gain insight into a particular issue uh and I think it's very important with oracles not to approach them from the sort of crude fortune-telling angle. Mm. Tell me what's going to happen. Mm. Tell me, you know, 
what's going to happen in the future but to say can i have some insight please into you know this issue i'm struggling with or uh can i have some insight into you know what i might need for today or you know um and then and then you and then you pick a card uh, you know, just tuning in in that way to whatever it is you want to tune into, your higher self, your soul, uh, deity, the divine, the myth, the great mystery. And and it's uncanny how, when you do that, uh, how often you seem to pick a card that gives you some really helpful piece of uh, advice or direction. So that's one way. And then, and then in a way, uh, a, a broader version of the same thing is to do a spread or a reading, which... Um, people will be familiar with from tarot decks mm. it's where and so in the in the oracle we have various spreads that you can do from very simple ones of three cards through to nine cards and so on uh where you look at an issue from a number of different angles and you you get uh, a, a number of pieces of advice that hopefully kind of come together and and, and, and help you in some way so I'm holding it in my hand it's a beautiful illustration it's a stag on the cover of this box with a book um, illustrated book and 33 sacred animal cards so um, Philip thank you so much for speaking with me today it's a pleasure it's a pleasure